Emerging from the ruins of a brutal civil war, Spain was a nation divided by ideology, class, and trauma. Cities lay in ruins, families were torn apart, and neighbors who once shared meals now saw each other as enemies. But as the dust settled, order returned, not through reconciliation, but through the firm hand of General Francisco Franco, whose authoritarian regime promised peace at the cost of liberty. For the next four decades, Spain would live under a rule where political opposition was silenced, regional identities were crushed, and obedience was demanded at all levels of life. It was a regime born from conflict and sustained by fear. Yet for many, it represented the only stability they had ever known. How does a country rebuild itself when unity is enforced by violence and what happens when that unity begins to fracture? Hey everyone and welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll be continuing our series on the rise of fascist movements around the world by taking a look at the brutal dictatorship which reigned over Spain for over 50 years. We'll begin by discussing what fascism meant in the context of Spanish history, before delving into the story of the movement which brutalized millions. And make sure you stick around until the end to learn about how Spain recovered from Franco's rule. If you're new here, we'll release videos every week exploring specific historical events or figures as part of a larger monthly topic. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you end up liking this video, and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on the remaining videos exploring the rise of fascist movements around the world. When fear grips a nation, ambition often follows close behind. In Spain, leaders harnessed the widespread anxiety over communism and disorder, using it as a tool to justify repression and military control. To understand the rise of fascism in Spain, it is crucial to grasp how the Spanish context molded it into something distinct from the ideologies that took root in Italy and Germany. While Italian fascism embraced corporatism and German fascism leaned heavily into racial nationalism, Spanish fascism combined authoritarianism, nationalism, and Catholic traditionalism. Unlike its European counterparts, Spanish fascism did not initially have the same mass appeal or revolutionary fervor. Instead, it arose as a reaction to deep political, social, and economic instability following World War I, a time of upheaval that left Spaniards disillusioned and searching for order and national unity. Despite remaining neutral during World War I, Spain experienced significant internal turmoil. The war disrupted the nation's economy and intensified divisions between the ruling elite and the working class. Inflation soared, wages stagnated, and industrial strikes became commonplace. Discontent among laborers was matched by growing unrest among peasants, particularly in rural regions like Andalusia, where land ownership was concentrated in the hands of a few elites. In urban areas, radical socialist and anarchist movements gained traction, leading to violent clashes with the state and employers. Amid this rising class conflict, the monarchy struggled to maintain control. King Alfonso XIII presided over a government marred by corruption and inefficiency, which undermined public trust. Attempts at political reforms, including decentralizing power to regional governments like Catalonia, fueled resentment among conservative factions who saw these changes as weakening the Spanish state. Meanwhile, the military, humiliated by defeats in colonial wars in Morocco and marginalized under the Republic, felt alienated and embittered, ready to intervene in civilian politics to restore what it saw as Spain's honor. This volatile mix of economic instability, class conflict, regionalism, and political dysfunction set the stage for authoritarian solutions. For many Spaniards, democracy seemed incapable of addressing the chaos, and both the left and right began exploring more radical paths. On the left, communists and anarchists sought revolutionary change, while on the right, conservatives and nationalists began embracing authoritarian ideologies. In this atmosphere, Spain's most recognizable fascist movement, Falange Española, emerged in 1933. Founded by José Antonio Primo de Rivera, the son of a former dictator, the Falange sought to unite Spaniards under a vision of national renewal through authoritarian rule. Drawing inspiration from Mussolini's Italy, Primo de Rivera preached unity, militarism, and anti-communism. However, unlike Italian fascism, Spanish fascism emphasized a mystical connection between Spain's identity and Catholic values, blending nationalism with religious traditionalism. The Falange attracted supporters from disaffected sectors of society, conservative students disillusioned with liberalism, lower middle class professionals fearful of socialist revolution, and military officers frustrated with the instability of the republic. 
What made the movement appealing to these groups was not only its promise to crush leftist uprisings, but also its pledge to restore Spain's historical greatness, free from the influence of foreign ideologies. While the Falange was gaining traction, the Spanish military also began moving closer toward authoritarianism. After years of humiliation in colonial conflicts and marginalization under the Republic, many officers believed that only a strong, centralized government could save Spain from disintegration. When political leaders failed to quell the unrest sweeping the nation, military officers increasingly saw themselves as the only force capable of restoring order. The situation deteriorated in 1936 with the election of the Leftist Popular Front, a coalition of communists, socialists, and anarchists. To the Spanish right, this government represented the final straw, a prelude to communist revolution. Conservative leaders, Catholic clergy, and industrialists, fearful of losing their power and influence, began seeking alliances with far-right elements, including the Falange and the military, to overthrow the Republic. Amidst this tension, General Francisco Franco emerged as a key figure. Initially one of several military leaders plotting against the Republic, Franco's organizational skills and diplomatic acumen soon set him apart. After the failed coup of July 1936 escalated into a full-blown civil war, Franco consolidated power, becoming the Generalissimo and head of the nationalist forces. With support from fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, he led a brutal campaign against the Republicans. The Spanish Civil War became a battleground of ideologies, with fascism confronting communism and democracy. Franco's forces, unified under authoritarian leadership, gradually overpowered the fractured Republican side, which was hampered by internal divisions and insufficient international support. By 1939, the nationalists declared victory, and Franco established a dictatorship that would last until his death in 1975. The rise of fascism in Spain was thus a complex process shaped by a unique combination of historical circumstances. Economic hardship, social unrest, political fragmentation, and a longing for stability led many Spaniards to embrace authoritarian solutions. The fusion of nationalism with Catholic traditionalism gave Spanish fascism a distinct character, setting it apart from its European counterparts. The legacy of this period remains a profound chapter in Spain's history, offering enduring lessons on the vulnerabilities of democratic institutions in times of crisis. After years of bloody conflict, the people of Spain were drained of hope and resolve, leaving them vulnerable to the cold embrace of an authoritarian regime promising stability. The fascist takeover of Spain began with the eruption of the Spanish Civil War in 1936, a brutal conflict that would pave the way for General Francisco Franco's authoritarian rule. The seeds of the uprising were sown shortly after the Popular Front's victory in the 1936 election. Groups of military officers, both active and retired, began plotting a coup to overthrow the democratically elected Republican government. By April, General Emilio Mola emerged as the leader of a national conspiracy network. Despite the Republican government's attempts to reshuffle suspect generals, including transferring Franco to command of the Canary Islands and moving Mola to Pamplona, the measures were insufficient to thwart the looming rebellion. The assassination of the conservative politician Jose Calvo Sotelo by Republican police officers in July 1936 acted as a catalyst for the coup. Outrage over the murder galvanized right-wing factions and provided a public justification for the military uprising. On July 17, 1936, the revolt began in Spanish Morocco and quickly spread to the mainland. Franco, leveraging his influence and reputation from his previous role suppressing the Asturian miners' strike in 1934, flew from the Canary Islands to Morocco to take command of the Army of Africa. Franco's ascent to power was neither swift nor uncontested. The coup did not result in an immediate victory, but instead ignited a civil war that raged until 1939. The conflict was fueled by deep ideological logical divisions between the left-wing Republicans, comprising anarchists, communists, socialists, and liberal Democrats, and the right-wing nationalists, which included conservative factions, monarchists, Carlists, and the fascist Falange Party. Franco rapidly consolidated power among the nationalists, becoming their undisputed leader after the deaths of other key figures like Generals San Giorgio and Mola. Securing power was a methodical and merciless process. Franco's forces strategically targeted cities, regions, and infrastructure essential for controlling the country. With significant support from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, including troops, aircraft, and military equipment, the nationalists gained critical advantages. 
The infamous German Condor Legion played a pivotal role, most notably in the devastating bombing of Guernica, which became a symbol of the war's atrocities. In territories under nationalist control, Franco moved swiftly to stamp out dissent. The regime orchestrated a campaign of brutal repression known as the White Terror, characterized by mass executions, forced disappearances, and imprisonment of political opponents. Estimates suggest that between 100,000 and 200,000 people were killed during this period. Franco's forces targeted suspected Republicans, labor organizers, intellectuals, and anyone deemed a threat to the new order. Simultaneously, a pervasive propaganda machine promoted unity under a fascist nationalist banner, framing the regime as the guardian of traditional Spain against the perceived threats of socialism, secularism, and foreign influence. Resistance to Franco's takeover emerged from various corners of Spanish society. Though it was fragmented and ultimately suppressed, Republican forces fought valiantly during the Civil War, but struggled with internal divisions and lacked cohesive leadership. After the fall of Madrid in 1939, organized resistance within Spain diminished significantly. However, guerrilla fighters known as the Maquis continued to wage a clandestine struggle against the Francoist regime well into the 1950s. These groups conducted sabotage, assassinations, and raids aiming to destabilize the dictatorship. Despite their efforts, the Maquis were systematically hunted down and many were killed or imprisoned. With power firmly in his grasp, Franco focused on reshaping Spain according to his authoritarian vision. In the regime's early days, Franco dismantled the democratic structures of the Spanish Republic. Political parties were outlawed, and all political activity was consolidated under the Falange Española Tradicionalista y de las Jones, the solely legal party formed by merging the Falange with other right-wing factions. Unions were dissolved, and civil liberties such as free speech and press were abolished. The regime abolished regional autonomy in places like Catalonia and the Basque Country, banning their languages and cultural expressions in an effort to forge a homogeneous national identity centered around Castilian traditions. The Catholic Church was elevated to a position of significant influence, regaining its privileged status in Spanish society. Education and public policy were heavily influenced by Catholic doctrine, reversing the secularization efforts of the Republic. Franco's policies also reinforced traditional gender roles. Women were pushed out of the workforce and encouraged to return to domestic life, reflecting the regime's deeply conservative social values. Internationally, one of Franco's most strategic early moves was his stance during World War II. While ideologically aligned with Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy, Franco declared Spain non-belligerent and later neutral, a decision influenced by the country's economic fragility after the Civil War and the desire to avoid further conflict. This position allowed Franco to consolidate his regime internally without the strains of global warfare. Despite this, Spain provided material support to the Axis powers, including the deployment of the Blue Division, volunteer troops who fought alongside German forces on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. Franco's regime was characterized by its oppressive tactics and the cultivation of a cult of personality. The government maintained strict control over all aspects of life, including censorship of the media, surveillance of citizens, and suppression of any form of dissent. The legacy of the Spanish Civil War and the repressive measures that followed left deep scars on Spanish society. For millions of Spaniards, life under Francisco Franco's rule was a balancing act between fear and survival. Every decision, whether to speak, resist, or conform, held the power to shape their future. Franco's regime imposed strict control over society, transforming personal and public life into a carefully monitored stage where deviation could result in exile, imprisonment, or worse. Life under Franco was built on repression. Citizens were under constant surveillance, fearing denunciation by neighbors or even family members for subversive speech or behaviors. Public institutions, from schools to churches, were converted into instruments of state propaganda, promoting conservative values, loyalty to the regime, and Catholic morality. The press, literature, and media were censored, ensuring that Franco's version of Spain, unified, obedient, and devout, remained unchallenged. Publications seen as immoral or politically dangerous were banned outright, restricting access to ideas that might undermine the state. Franco's vision of national unity led to the suppression of Spain's regional identities. In Catalonia and the Basque Country, speaking local languages became illegal in schools, government offices, and public spaces. 
traditions deemed un-Spanish were banned, with only those like bullfighting and flamenco promoted as symbols of national pride. Over time, these cultural restrictions eased, but the scars of repression lingered. Women faced particularly harsh restrictions under Franco's regime. The state reinforced traditional gender roles by legally stripping women of autonomy. Married women could not open bank accounts or work without their husband's consent, and divorce, contraception, and abortion were criminalized. Education for women focused on homemaking and child-rearing, aligning with the state's emphasis on the family as the cornerstone of society. The Catholic Church reinforced these norms, leaving women with little recourse to escape their prescribed roles. In the early years of Franco's rule, economic hardship dominated daily life. The devastation of the Spanish Civil War left infrastructure in ruins, and the regime's policy of autarky, economic self-sufficiency, only worsened the situation. Isolated from the international economy and excluded from the Marshall Plan, Spain experienced severe shortages of food, goods, and resources. Poverty, rationing, and malnutrition became defining aspects of life, with black markets emerging as one of the few ways to secure essential items. The 1940s and early 1950s were marked by economic stagnation, as Franco's government struggled to rebuild without external support. By the mid-1950s, Spain began shifting toward economic liberalization, largely driven by the regime's need to attract foreign investment and tourism. Technocrats, many affiliated with Opus Dei, replaced fascist ideologues in government positions, promoting policies that modernized Spain's economy. The 1959 Stabilization Plan opened Spain to the global economy, ushering in what would become known as the Spanish Miracle. Although economic growth improved living conditions, wealth was unevenly distributed. Those loyal to Franco enjoyed privileges, while workers and political dissenters faced exploitation under strict labor controls, with independent trade unions outlawed. Franco's regime maintained control through fear and violence. Political dissent was ruthlessly suppressed, with tens of thousands of prisoners executed or sent to forced labor camps in the years following the Civil War. The Guardia Civil and Policia Armada patrolled towns and cities enforcing the regime's authority. Political opponents, including socialists, communists, and regional nationalists, were imprisoned, tortured, or exiled. Even during the regime's later years, public protests were met with brutal crackdowns, and the regime's secret police continued to monitor citizens. One of the most disturbing legacies of Franco's regime was the kidnapping and sale of children, particularly the infants of political prisoners. Many of these children were given to families loyal to the regime or sold through Catholic institutions, leaving thousands of victims to discover their true identities only decades later. As Spain entered the 1960s, the regime began to relax some of its harshest policies. Economic growth fostered the rise of a middle class that, while benefiting from prosperity, also began to demand greater freedoms. Student protests erupted in universities and labor strikes became more frequent. Though both were met with repression, Franco's health deteriorated during the 1970s, signaling the regime's eventual decline. Franco attempted to secure the continuity of his government by designating Spain as a monarchy in 1947, although he left the throne vacant until 1969, when he named Prince Juan Carlos as his successor. Despite these efforts, opposition to the regime grew. Upon Franco's death in 1975, Juan Carlos swiftly initiated Spain's transition to democracy. Known as the transition, this delicate process required negotiations between reformists, opposition leaders, and military officials to prevent a return to violence. By 1977, Spain held its first free elections, marking a definitive break from fascism. The transition to democracy allowed Spain to rebuild politically but not without controversy. The Pacto del Olvido, Pact of Forgetting, discouraged prosecutions for crimes committed under Franco's regime, aiming to foster national reconciliation. However, this decision left many victims of repression without justice, sparking ongoing debates about how Spain should reckon with its past. Despite these challenges, Spain's transformation from an authoritarian state to a democratic society stands as a testament to the resilience of its people. Though the legacy of Franco's rule remains contested, the Spanish people reclaimed their freedom, building a society that embraces cultural diversity and democratic values.
After Franco's death in 1975, Spain transitioned from dictatorship to democracy through a delicate process led by King Juan Carlos, who had been groomed by Franco as his successor. While Juan Carlos was initially loyal to Francoist principles, he soon worked to restore the monarchy and pushed for democratic reforms, appointing Adolfo Suarez as prime minister. Suarez oversaw the 1977 elections and the drafting of Spain's 1978 constitution, solidifying democracy. A pivotal part of this transition was the Pact of Forgetting, Pacto del Olvido. This agreement between political factions sought to leave behind the atrocities of the Civil War and Franco's regime, opting not to prosecute those responsible to foster unity. However, this decision left unresolved tensions that persist today, especially surrounding the legacy of Franco's rule. Spain continues to grapple with the implications of the pact, as seen in ongoing debates about exhuming Franco's remains from the Valley of the Fallen, and the need for historical justice through new memory laws. This reconciliation process, though imperfect, has shaped Spain's modern identity and helped it avoid the wave of populism seen in other nations. Nonetheless, Spaniards remain divided over how to address the lingering shadows of their past. Thank you so much for watching our video on Spanish fascism. We hope you enjoyed this video and are looking forward to more videos in this series. If you did, make sure you don't miss our video next week exploring when fascism was on the rise in Canada. Before you go, make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more history-related content.